Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back to this uh, day number four of the um, workshop on programmable data planes with uh, P4. So we're starting the final part of the workshop and we will be discussing uh, today uh, more advanced topics. Um, specifically, we will start with uh, uh, stateful elements and uh, metadata and doing very interesting things such as monitoring uh, the Q occupancy of the switch and a few other similar topics. Uh, before we start, I wanna uh, review what we did so far. Yesterday, Wednesday, we finished uh, the first lab library, the, the fundamentals of P4. And the plan for today is to start these more advanced topics um, and today we will discuss uh, uh, standard metadata. We will learn what is that about and how to use counters uh, and tomorrow how to use uh, registers in the data plane. So those are uh, stateful elements, stateful. We will go over it, but um, what it means is that we can uh, store information in the data plane. So that's what it means. So that information is available uh, after packets uh, leave the data plane. Still, we, we can keep uh, information about uh, not only packets, but uh, traffic flows. So that's quite uh, powerful. Uh, those are quite powerful elements. So and uh, before we start, Before we start, I wanna mention here in the cyber training uh, webpage in our website are all the lab libraries uh, that we have developed at the University of South Carolina. So the library that we will be covering in the last two days, we will not be able to cover all, but um, um, I hope that it's gonna be cover most, the most relevant uh, labs and topics is this virtual library on uh, programmable data planes, application stateful elements and custom packet processing. So that's what we're gonna be doing uh, today and tomorrow Friday. And here the list of, the list of labs, uh, as I said before on Monday, all these labs are available in NetLab. Um, so if you have access to NetLab systems, you can install uh, these lab libraries in your system. Um, back to our uh, workshop website. The program for today. Uh, and before I forget, uh, the, the recording of day number one is online and Jose is working on uh, uploading the recording of day two and three. But I, I have been told that these videos are already in the platform, in the Western Academy platform. So you, you, you have access to those. Um, we will be uploading uh, within the next hour or so, uh, hopefully here in, in our website, in the workshop website here at USC. Okay, so let's start with um, our program today. So we'll start with, uh, uh, standard metadata encounters, and then we will follow by uh, a lab exercise. Uh, on my opinion, quite interesting, monitoring the switch queue using standard metadata. Uh, we'll talk more about that. Um, then we will uh, see how to measure flow statistics using uh, this um, um, Structures called counters, direct and indirect counters. Um, there is a question from Paul. Will the lab virtual machine be available for download uh, with the advanced series? Um, Paul, the answer is yes. And in fact, I believe that right here uh, under resources, uh, you have the virtual machine, uh, the link to the virtual machine that we're using with um, the two libraries, um, but I will let um, Eli and Jose to 
extend on that. Is that correct, Eli Jose? Uh, actually, the that VM is for the first lab series. We are gonna post soon for these advanced before okay. labs as well. All right, Paul is gonna be uh, by the end of today. It's gonna be here the link to um, to the VM. And Jose, you might want to clarify what this VM is for. So for which lab library? So sure. All right, so let's start with our program. Um, uh, again, there's uh, the nice thing about P4, in my opinion, one of the nice thing is that um, um, there are not that many um, data structures or, or uh, uh, objects, uh, but the few objects that we have to learn are enough and, and very powerful. So if uh, we will be learning two, uh, of these uh, two type of objects, actually one, which is counters, but there are two type of counters. And, and tomorrow we will learn registers. And, and there are not that many, I mean, counters, register, and something else that is called meters. But with these uh, three type of objects, much can be done. So that's one of the nice thing about uh, P4. So let's start with um, our lecture. Um, I will go over these PowerPoint slides and we will talk about a standard metadata encounters. Okay, um, let's start with this uh, standard metadata topic. We will discuss what is this. Uh, metadata is a state that is data associated with each packet. Um, for every packet that is coming to the data plane, there is some information that uh, we can use for computation in the data plane. So it can be treated like a set of variables associated with each packet and uh, can be read and can be written by actions executed by tables. Um, some metadata has a special uh, meaning. Uh, for example, when you read uh, documents related to um, P4, uh, you might find this, uh, these two words, intri intrinsic metadata. What that means is this is metadata, data associated with, with each packet. But the intrinsic is because uh, it is uh, intrinsic semantics. It's unique to the operation of the switch that you are programming. So there will be intrinsic metadata for our uh, B1 model switch. There will be uh, a similar, not exactly the same, but probably similar intrinsic, intrinsic metadata for a hardware switch by Tofino and so on. So here we have an example and we will use uh, some of this uh, intrinsic metadata for our lab today, the, the first lab. I didn't list all of the intrinsic metadata, but uh, uh, some quite relevant are here. So this is for the V1 model. So for example, ingress port right here is a uh, uh, bit nine. Um, uh, data and that indicates the port the packet is arriving from. So this is the ingress port. Uh, if, um, or actually we have to do it, if we want to forward the packet to an egress port, we have to set this value egress spec. This is egress spec. Uh, where do we want to send the packet, the egress, uh, egress port? So ingress, egress, um, there are a lot of information, uh, metadata. Uh, uh, for example, this is quite interesting, ingress global timestamp. So for every packet that um, arrived to the switch, we can get a, a timestamp in microseconds that indicates when the packet uh, start being processed by the ingress pipeline. 
Uh, similar, we have egress global timestamp. Uh, it's a timestamp in microseconds that is uh, set when the packet uh, starts being processed by the egress pipeline. Uh, there are a few others that are interesting uh, in queue, queue depth. This is the depth of the queue, and the queue is just uh, memory where packets are called momentarily uh, when the packet is first in queue. So how many packets are before this packet that just arrived? So this is the application that we'll be working on. And um, Eli will describe uh, a little bit more uh, in a few minutes. But um, let's say that there is a network as we have here, H1, 2, 3, and 4. And uh, H1 and 3 are sending to H2 and H4. And uh, there is a bottleneck. So let's say that this H1 and H3 want to send traffic to 2 and 4 at the highest speed as possible. They have traffic all the time. And there is a bottleneck here. So whenever we have a bottleneck, there will be uh, a queue that will be formed at the egress interface. In this case, we will have a queue here inside the switch for all those packets that uh, want to leave uh, through the bottleneck link. And the queue will increase over time if the senders uh, do not reduce the sending rate. So this is a, an example, an application, that what we can do with this switch. So we can compute the time the packet is waiting in the queue. And the queue is uh, implemented uh, inside the traffic manager. So here we have our V1 model and uh, our parser, ingress pipeline, the traffic manager, and here inside the traffic manager, we have the queue. So how much time the packet is uh, momentarily waiting here? That's what we want to uh, compute. And actually the, that time is the, the time that dominates the entire uh, delay of this packet before reaching the destination. Because the ingress pipeline and egress pipeline um, processing uh, uh, latency is quite low. Uh, maybe tens or a uh, few hundreds nanoseconds. Um, so what we will be doing in, in, in the next lab is uh, we will, every time that a packet arrives, we will put a timestamp. Uh, and then we will do the same when the packet uh, enters the egress pipeline. And therefore that is uh, uh, approximately the time that is spent by, by the packet in the uh, buffer or in the traffic manager or in the queue. So that's what we're gonna be doing. And we will be using the metadata for, uh, for that. Um, again, Eli will be uh, describing in more detail this, but this will be the topology that we'll be using. Um, in addition to using metadata, what we'll be doing is uh, defining custom headers because we will store this information in, in uh, in a customized protocol, we will define our protocol and then um, the end host will be able to de-encapsulate this um, uh, customized uh, header and read this information, uh, how much time the packet was waiting in, in the switch S1 queue. So that will be the first part. The second part, we will talk about counters and counters um, are objects um, specifically, they are stateful objects. So what that means is uh, we can preserve information in the data plane by using these uh, stateful objects. Uh, this is in contrast of a stateless objects, the objects that we have been doing, we have been using so far. And those objects do not preserve the state, do not preserve information between packets. So for example, packet headers, those are uh, stateless uh, objects. So what are the stateful objects in P4? 
uh, tables, counters, meters, and registers. And we will be discussing uh, in this workshop counters and registers. So counters are the most simple uh, stateful objects. Registers are the most powerful uh, stateful objects. So we will be covering both. They are referred also as the stateful memories in the P4 language specification. So there are two types of counters. Um, the first type of counter uh, is the direct counter and the second is the indirect counter. Um, so what do they do? They uh, are useful for keeping a statistics. Uh, specifically, we want to uh, measure uh, or count the number of packets or the number of bytes uh, that are, for example, um, being routed routed to egress port two. So we can do that by using counters. What can we count with counters? Uh, we can count count. Uh, we can count packets. We can count bytes, or we can count both packets and bytes, uh, but that's it. So that's all we can do with, with counters. In the control plane, um, uh, we, can, uh, we can read the counters uh, and we can use them for other applications. So if we decide to build application on top of the control plane, we can have access to these counters. So the first type of counter, uh, direct counters, so these counters are always associated with a match action table. So they effectively extend the match action table. So here we have an example. We are creating a direct counter. So here in red, we have a direct counter. Uh, this is the name to the, the way to instantiate. And we can instantiate this. Notice that we are doing inside the control. Uh, the first and only parameter here in parentheses is the type of counter. So we're saying here that this counter will count both packets and bytes, um, but we can have also only packets or we can have only bytes. So those three options are available. So that's the way to instantiate a counter. The name that we are, uh, of the name of this counter is my direct counter. Um, then what we have to do, remember direct counters are associated to match action tables. So we have to specify the counter as a property of the table we're associating with. So in this case, we have a table for wording and we're associating this counter that we instantiate here with this table. And the way to instantiate is to have it as a property of the table. So notice here, counter equal to my direct counter. So that's a property of the table. Um, a single instantiation. So this single counter uh, always contain as many independent counter values as the number of entries in the table. So if we have a table of 32 entries, let's say this is the table here, 32 entries, we will have 32 counters. So one for each uh, entry. And notice that uh, we define these as a uh, packet counter and byte counter. So we have both. So what the entries here are indicating is the number of packets that uh, have matched so far with this entry and the number of, ma of bytes that uh, have matched with, with that entry. So that's the way to read. From the control plane, we can read these values. So we know how to interact uh, with the control plane using the command line interface that what we did yesterday. Uh, we can issue commands so we can read these counters, for example, the counter that we just instantiated before in the P4 program, here we're accessing, we're reading from the control plane. So we are uh, at the runtime 
command CLI. We are using this command counter read and then the name of the counter in this example is my ingress dot my, uh, dot my direct counter. Uh, my ingress is because this is the control where the counter was um, uh, instantiated. And then uh, one mean that we want to get the first entry. So notice that we had uh, my direct counter, we have uh, 32 entries. Um, so we are accessing the first element and this is giving us the information. For example, this counter um, has the value uh, 4,921,063 bytes and 72,880 packets have matched this entry. All right. Um, I don't know if there's any question. I, I don't see any. Uh, so that's that's direct counter. That's the 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 most basic um, stateful element um, of P4. The other type of counter is called indirect counter. Uh, indirect counters are independent counter uh, that can be referred to um, a specific entries or to a group of entries in the table. And we will see an example uh, shortly. Um, so one, um, I wanna highlight something here. Notice that in the case of direct counter, it's just one counter. And then this counter will have um, uh, 32 entries would be the size of the, of the table. In the case of indirect counter, we must specify the number of independent counter. You can think like an array size. Example, so let's instantiate a counter, an indirect counter of three elements. And we will count packets and we will count bytes. So the way to do it is, again, we have inside our control counter, the first parameter here of counter is uh, the number, the array elements. And the second one is, is the type of counter. In this case is packets and bytes again. Uh, similar to the direct counter, it could be packets, it could be bytes, or it could be both. And then we put a name to the counter. So the indirect counter have a method that is called count. And this is where the counter is incremented. So for example, for this indirect counter, let's say that we want to increment every time that is the packet is forwarded. So we have here, my indirect counter, which is the name of the counter that we instantiated before. And we are calling the method count with an index. And I will talk a little bit more about this index in the next slide. But basically this indicates which of these array elements, remember that the counter has three elements, we want to increment. So let's say that uh, we have our code. We have um, the counter with three elements and we want to use in this way. So we want to count packets and bytes that are matching with one, two, or three, our first entries. So every time that there is a match uh, in any of this, we will count here. That will be the first one. Um, anytime that there is a match between, uh, between the packet that is arriving and uh, entries four, five, and seven, we will increment our uh, second entry, second element. And then similar to the third one. So in this case, we don't need um, 32 counters. We just need three counters. 
So it makes sense to use an indirect counter. Um, back to the index. So notice that the index used to increment the counter is retrieved from the action data uh, from the table. That means this is set by the control plane because the control plane is uh, the one that uh, populate uh, the match action table. Um, however, that's the, the example that we will use in the lab, but it's not the only way to uh, use uh, the count method here. This could be an expression that uh, uh, is provided by um, the program here, uh, the, the P4 program, as needed by the program. Um, OK, so those are the counter and indirect counter. Similar to the, the direct counter, we can access the indirect counter values uh, from the control plane. Um, it's the same command. So we are again in the command line interface using this command counter read and then followed by the counter name, my ingress dot my indirect counter. We'll go one step back. This is the name, my indirect counter. And is my ingress because it's in the my ingress um, control. And we retrieve, uh, excuse me, we have to also provide the array element. And then we have the result here. This number of bytes, this number of packets uh, were forwarded uh, through this entry. All right, so the goal for today then is um, building this uh, nice application on my opinion. Um, we will try to figure out what is the, how much time a packet is uh, waiting in the queue of a switch using standard metadata. And the second lab will be about um, using Hi, counters. And welcome back to day number. We will use direct and direct counters and defining counters in P4 and reading these values from the control plane. So those are the two labs that uh, uh, we will be completing today. Um, I don't know if there's any questions. So if there is no question, so we are ready to start uh, the first of the labs. So feel free to make a reservation for a lab six and lab five, excuse me. And again, this is the, for those who join us a little bit late, we're starting with the second library is a programmable data plane application, a stateful elements and custom packet processing. So I believe that Elise is gonna guide us through this uh, lab, Eli, are you ready to share your screen? Yeah, for sure. All right, thank you, Dr. Jorge. So uh, I will just go very briefly on um, on some slides that will describe the objectives of the first lab. Um, so basically, our goal is to um, write a P4 program that will allow us to find uh, the current queue occupancy. And um, as Dr. Urge was saying, the queue starts building up whenever the bottleneck link or whenever the output link um, is being fully utilized. And because there's no more place to put more packets on that link, uh, the switches and the routers will usually have this memory, which is a buffer or a queue, and the packets will be temporarily stored there and wait, uh, and, and they will be uh, uh, dequeued and transmitted out of the output link. Um, so what we're going to do in this lab uh, is we have a topology of uh, um, core and hosts, so H1, H2, H3, and H4. We have a P4 switch, S1, and a regular legacy switch, which is S2. And the goal here is to observe the queue occupancy at the switch S1. Now, to do so, we have to make sure that uh, the output uh, 
link from switch S1 is limited. Uh, otherwise, if, if this output link is similar to the uh, input link, if they have the same uh, capacity and the same rate, uh, then it's not going to be the case where the uh, queue will start building up. So we want to make sure to limit the rate first. And in this example, we will set it to uh, 100 megabits per second. And at the same time, we will show you how we can also set the queue size. So how big this buffer or queue will be inside the uh, P4 switch. Uh, the second part is uh, we're going to run a throughput test using Hyper3. Hyper3 is a tool in Linux that allows you to run some throughput test and you will see how much um, uh, bits per second you can push on a certain path. Uh, and so the path here will be from H3 to H4, and therefore we're going to be going over this bottleneck. So when we run the throughput test, we should be able to see a value close to 100 megabits per second. And by running the throughput test, we will make sure that this link will be fully utilized and the queue will start building up at switch S1. And then what we're going to do is we're going to send a probe packet uh, and actually multiple probe packets from host H1 to host H2. Now, these probe packets will be sent and um, received at the first switch, switch S1. And this is the P4 switch that will basically uh, write the values for the queuing delay inside the headers. Now, here we are using a custom protocol, as Dr. Khe was saying, and I will talk a little bit about uh, the fields of this protocol. But the idea is there would be some background traffic through this throughput test that will uh, make sure that this link is fully utilized. And meanwhile, we will be probing to see what is the queue occupancy at the switch S1. Okay. Now the results will be observed at H2 because on H2 we'll be running a, a sniffer that will look at the packets and see what are the header fields there. Uh, so what is this protocol? Uh, what does it look like? So this is a custom protocol that we just came up with. Um, doesn't mean that that's the only way to do it. But basically, um, we have five fields. And the first field is the switch ID. It's eight bits. And this field will store uh, the switch identifier. So for example, in our topology, this is going to be the value one because this is switch S1. So in case you have multiple switches and you want to see which uh, switch has this queue being built up. This is where you identify the switch in this field. Then we have the ingress timestamp, 48 bits. This is the microsecond timestamp um, when the packet shows up on egress, uh, on ingress, sorry. And then the same thing for the egress. Uh, so that when the packet shows up on the egress side. <clears throat> also, we're going to show that in P4, you can do some basic arithmetic. So for example, if we subtract uh, here, egress minus ingress timestamp, we're going to get the uh, difference, the time difference between the two timestamps, which would give us uh, uh, an approximation of the queuing delay. And also, the final field is called queue depth. This is going to show us uh, the number of packets in the queue uh, when, when, when our pro packet arrived. So here, the unit is in packets at the queue depth, whereas the time difference is in time and specifically in microseconds. Now the fields will be set by the sender. They will be initialized to zero. And then the P4 switch will parse this custom header. So we need to write first the headers and the parser. And then um, during the processing blocks, we're gonna be overwriting the fields with the correct values for these um, timestamps and time difference and queue depths. Okay. So this is what we're gonna do now. Uh, next, I will go to the uh, NetLab. And I will start a new reservation. Um, I'm just I just want to show when doing a reservation here that uh, you have to click on this one, the P4 applications and custom processing, because now we are in the second uh, library. So we go ahead and click on that and select lamb number five. Uh, just reserve a pod. Uh, select some time and then make sure that your reservation has started. And then we're gonna enter that up. Um, so as as we go through the lab, um, there are some references that you can see. Uh, specifically, for example, here I have this uh, page open for the BMV2 simple switch target. So many of the um, fields that Dr. Jorge was showing in the 
as standard metadata, you can see them here and they will contain um, a really nice description about them. So in case you want to explore more fields and see what you can do more with this before switch. Do and you we can- Do you want to share that, um, Eli, in the chat window? Sure. And we can also post it on the resources. Yeah. All right, so um, as usual, let us divide the screen and then All right. Um, so yes. as usual. Sorry, Ellie. Just uh, Thomas. Yeah, Thomas, I will be posting shortly the URL of the website. All right. Um, so as usual, on the left hand side, we have the manual. We start with a table of content and overview, objective, the settings. And you can see that even with this lab, uh, series, the advanced one, we are still using the same credentials, so it's password. Um, the introduction, just some theoretical uh, background on the type of delays, queuing delay, processing delay, and propagation delay, so what is the difference between those? Um, and then how we can extract some of these timestamps in P4, how can we access them through the standard metadata? And uh, section two, we will start with the hands-on uh, hands-on session, okay? Um, so let's start by going to mini edit by clicking on the uh, desktop icon and type in the password, password or small caps as shown here. Then we're gonna be opening uh, the topology of lab number five. So file, open, lab five. And we can see now we have a P4 switch and the legacy switch here and the four end hosts, all right? And the next step is to, of course, start the simulation by clicking on the run button. All right, so uh, now that we have the uh, topology started, we have the whole emulation ready, we can start by um, coding the P4 program. So first I will minimize the windows and then go to the terminal um, icon on the desktop. And from there, we're gonna be launching our uh, editor, Visual Studio Code. So code before labs and lab five. Okay. So um, same thing here, we have on the left-hand side, the files and on the right-hand side, you, you see the content of each file. And what we're gonna start with is uh, defining our custom header. Uh, so that's the header that I was showing in the last slide. And to do so, uh, we have to go to the headers.p4 file. And there uh, we will start by typing all the fields inside the header. But before we do that, let us define a constant um, which will uh, specify uh, the, the value that the IPv4 will use to know what is the next field, right? So. This is similar to whenever you have a value that will uh, correspond to TCP or UDP. So we are talking about the next layer in the uh, OSI stack. So uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create our custom headers and therefore we're gonna give it some custom time to be specified there. Okay, and this custom value is zero XFD. So we're gonna define it here. It's const bit eight and then type custom equals to zero X FD. And we just came up with this value. You can specify any other value. Okay. And then the next step is to actually define our, um, our headers. So I will scroll down because we already have the ethernet and the IPv4 already written for us. So here is where we're gonna define our own header. So we start by using the header keyword and then uh, what, what, what is the uh, name of the type that we're gonna use for that header? So we're calling it here switch underscore stats underscore T. Uh, this is completely up to you. You can call it wherever you want. Um, we are just using it for storing the stats of the switch and this is why we came up with this name. 
Okay. And now, as usual, we start listing the fields. So first, we have an 8-bit field that will uh, store the switch ID. Okay, so bit 8 and switch ID. Then we have bit 48 um, for the ingress timestamp. We also have another 48 bits for the egress timestamp. Uh, we have another 48 bits for the time difference. And finally, we have um, the 24 bits for the Q depth. So um, we're going to see this later on, but we specified here 24 because by default, the Q depth is, uh, is 19 bits. And if you use 19, uh, what's going to happen is your header won't be byte aligned. So it's not going to be a multiple of eight and the compiler will throw an error. So we have to make sure that the sum of all the fields uh, is a multiple of eight. Okay. So you can either use 24 or use a, a lesser value that is a multiple of eight. Okay. Um, next, we're going to specify uh, that this header uh, that we created, the switch stat, uh, is also part of our uh, header struct. So we're going to instantiate here. So switch stats. I'm writing this command. Switch stats t. And we're going to call it switch underscore stats. OK. Uh, next, we're going to make sure to save the file by pressing Control S or File Save. All right, so now we have the headers defined. Next, we have to modify our parser so that the P4 switch will parse this custom header. So we're going to go ahead and uh, click on the parser.p4 file, which is located here in the file explorer. And we can see that uh, we have a start state already, the parse ethernet already written for us, uh, also the parse um, IPv4. We're going to write first um, state for parsing our custom header, and then we're going to modify the parse IPv4 so that all the states are uh, connected to each other. OK? So the state here would be described as um, state, and then the state name, we're going to call it parse underscore switch stats. And there we're going to extract, so packet dot extract, header dot switch underscore stats. Okay, remember we are accessing this switch stats because we put it as part of our header struct. So now we can access it here. And then we're going to transition to accept state, which takes us to the next block, uh, specifically the ingress block. But um, so far, what's happening is that after parsing the ethernet, we're going to go to IPv4 if the type is IPv4. Uh, and then we're going to accept here. And we don't want this. We want to proceed further with the parsing. And this is why we need to um, we need to modify the parse IPv4 state and make a, a transition based on a condition, right? And the way to do it is um, after extracting the IPv4, instead of transitioning to the accept uh, state, we're going to transition and then use some condition here. So transition select. We will be uh, checking the value of the protocol field in the IPv4 header and see if the value is equal to the um, custom protocol type, right? And this is what we wrote at the beginning of the program in the headers. So we specified this value, 0xfd. And so we're saying that if that value is present in the uh, protocol feed in the IPv4, let us switch to the parse uh, switch stat. And then if not, we're going to just use the default to go to um, accept. OK. Ellie, for further clarification and just for um, the learners, um, you are creating your own custom protocol at, uh, at layer four, so or encapsulated inside an IP packet. Right. So mm -hmm. is that right? Yes, that's correct. It's same as uh, when you have parsed the protocol field, you want to go to CP or UDP. Instead of doing that, now we're going to the parse, uh, sorry, the switch stats protocol. 
Okay. Um, next, we're gonna save the file. So Control S. And um, next, we're gonna start by pro programming the pipeline. Now, keep in mind that the goal here is to compute the uh, queue length and see what's happening inside our queue. And if you remember in the architecture, this is all part of the traffic manager. And the traffic manager sits between the ingress and the egress. So if you want to get some statistics or counts or information about what happened in the traffic manager, we want to make sure that we go to the egress pipeline so that we can basically use the um, uh, the metadata that are specific to the egress, right? So um, and, and therefore, we're going to go to the egress now, .p4, and this is where we're going to write the logic of um, basically overwriting the timestamps. Now, keep in mind that we are assuming at this point that the forwarding is already there. So if we go to the ingress.p4, you can see that we have a table that will uh, be responsible for forwarding the traffic. All right. Uh, but we're going to be focusing in this lab on just the um, egress, right? Because this is where we're going to write the values. And what we're going to do, we're going to do something that we didn't do, uh, we didn't um, uh, explain before, but it's always possible to create an action without uh, having a table. And if you do that, you'll be able to basically uh, directly call that action without having to apply a table. Now, this doesn't mean that the action is by itself dangling uh, in the background or behind the scene. The compiler will be creating a table. We'll give it like a random name and we'll associate this action to the table, right? But for readability, because this, this action is going to be always executed in our case, uh, we don't have to uh, create a table for it. This is going to make our code uh, smaller. But if you do so, it's completely fine. OK, so let's start by writing now the action. So we're going to call it modify. Um, you can give it a more meaningful name for sure. Uh, and what we're going to do here first is start by assigning uh, the value of our switch, right? So the identifier of our switch. So here we're given, giving it the value 1. And to do that, we have to use header dot switch stats so that we can go to the custom headers that we defined and there we're gonna uh, um, we're gonna uh, specify the field which is switch id and give it some value here in this case in this one now keep in mind that this might not be the most optimal way to do it so what you can do is you can have a parameter here right uh, for this modify that will be specified for the control plane and this parameter will be the switch id so this way if you compile the program and you push it to multiple switches, um, every time you push it to a switch, you have to tell it that this is switch one or this is switch two or, or N. But because in our example, we only have one switch, so we made it uh, simpler. And we just hard coded the value here in the, um, uh, in the P4 code. Okay, next we're gonna be filling the, um, uh, the field, which is ingress timestamp. Now, where do we get the value for this ingress timestamp? Um, there is um, there is a field which is part of the standard metadata called ingress global timestamp. So, standard metadata is already available to us. You can see it here in the uh, definition of the control. All we have to do is just write standard metadata dot and then ingress global timestamp. And again, this is the timestamp in microseconds okay uh, which is basically set when the package shows up at the ingress uh, block all right and the same thing we're gonna do so i will just copy the previous uh, line and we're gonna change the ingress timestamp to egress now and of course we need to change the ingress global timestamp to egress global timestamp so what we're doing here we are uh, we are setting the value of the timestamp that is in the switch in our header, right? So on uh, whenever you see later on how the packet will be received, you're going to see the timestamp, but you're not going to see the queuing delay at this point. So how can we compute the queuing delay? Um, and I'm saying queuing delay because this is the delay that is dominating, but actually when we calculate the difference between now the these two fields, uh, we are also considering the processing delay in the 
uh, pipelines. Okay, so if we type header dot switch stats dot time diff, so this is the field that we created, and what we're gonna specify here is standard metadata dot egress global timestamp minus. So we are doing an arithmetic operation here, the standard metadata dot ingress global timestamp, right? So I'm taking the timestamp uh, when the packet was seen at the egress block, right? And then I'm uh, um, subtracting the timestamp when the packet arrived at the ingress block. So this will give you all the time uh, of the packet spent in the ingress and the traffic manager. Uh, uh, in your switch. Okay. Now, um, also, we can store um, the queue depth. And the queue depth here is um, how many packets. So the unit here is packets instead of uh, time. So how many packets were inside our queue? And there is a field for that in the standard metadata called in queue queue depth. But recall, I was saying that um, we modified th this field to bit 24 because we need to have our header byte aligned or multiple of eight. Uh, and because the EQ Q depth is 19 bits in the standard metadata, that's how it is defined in the architecture. So we, we need to make sure to cast this value, right? And the casting here is similar to um, many other programming languages. So all you have to write is uh, the the type that you want to cast to here, it's bit 24, and then standard metadata dot in Q underscore Q depth. Okay. Um, so if you look at these uh, uh, fields that we wrote, time time difference, we could have just uh, wrote the time difference and exclude the writing of the two timestamps. And this is completely fine. You will still see the time difference at the receiver side. Uh, but just to show you how these values look like in the switch, we decided to write them into the headers. Uh, but always make sure when you create a custom protocol uh, to insert whatever is really necessary for your application. OK? Ellie, I think there is a question. Mm -hmm. In a topology with multiple switches, how could you dynamically set the switch ID? Is there any metadata that the switch could always push with its ID? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, yeah, thank you for that question. It's, it's really important. Uh, basically, all you have to do is, uh, first, there is nothing special that will tell you this is a uh, switch one or switch two. You have to do that manually. And the way to do it is uh, you will modify this action here and write something like bit uh, eight and then switch ID, right? And here, instead of writing equals to one, you would write equals to the switch ID. Now, then you will create a table and associate this modify to that table. And as we did yesterday, when we populated the forwarding table, we specified some action parameters or action data, you would do that at, uh, at the simple switch CLI. So you would say, okay, now I'm gonna add a new uh, entry for this table that will say that my switch is called switch one my this other switch is switch to and so on and so forth so Ali, basically what you are saying is uh let the control plane enumerate you are switch one you are switch two three and so on because mm -hmm. that value is coming from the control plane precisely yeah all right uh christian do you have uh feel free to unmute yourself um sure okay can, uh, can you hear me yes, yes. Okay, I, I, I have a question. Uh, did you mention um, about the traffic manager? So uh, what are the main functions or applications of traffic manager in the P4 architecture? And also, is it possible to modify something about the traffic manager? All right, uh, yeah, thank you, Christian, for the question. Hi, um, <laughs> hello, Christian. So uh, to answer your first part, uh, the traffic manager is the main component that's responsible for basically doing packet forwarding, uh, doing the queuing part, um, cloning, um, 
uh, mirroring packets. So everything that is related to basically how you are dealing with the packet whenever you want to send it out. Uh, multicasting is another example and so on. So there, there are a lot of features that you can do there. Now, we talked about how this traffic manager is non not P4 programmable. So we can't program it in P4. We can't change its behavior. Um, however, we can change it from the control plane. And later on in this lab, we're going to show how we can configure this traffic manager or part of the traffic manager, specifically how we can change the buffer size and how we can uh, change the output rate of a certain link. But certainly at the same um, uh, at the same interface, which is the simple switch CLI or the control plane, you will be able to do other things related to traffic manager, such as creating multicast groups, associating nodes to groups, uh, uh, set up uh, mirroring, and, and so on and so forth. So all of these uh, will be shown in the uh, control plane uh, interface, which is the simple switch CLI, and we're going to show a few of them for this lab. Okay, Ali, thank you. Yeah, from. Thank you. All right. Uh, so now that we have our uh, action ready, all we have to do is just call it as if we are calling a regular function. So we uh, recall that when we apply a table, we write the table name dot apply. But here it's an action. Sorry, it should be modified. So we call it by its name and then we use the parentheses as if, as if we are invoking a regular function. Okay. And of course, you can make it even more um, like a, a cleaner code. So you can have an if statement that will check if the header or switch stats is valid and put it here. And then you modify this also uh, is, is also a better pra practice. But we're just making it as simple as possible here. Okay. And then next, I will save the file. So control S. And of course, we don't have to forget about our the parser, right? So um, we parsed in our parser the Ethernet, the IPv4, and our custom protocol, the switch stats, right? And so we have to make sure that you are emitting that header in the, the parser. And we can see that we only have here emit for the Ethernet the IPv4. Uh, and therefore, we have to add a sentence to uh, basically emit also the headers for our new custom protocols. So packet dot emit header dot switch underscore stats. Okay. All right. So at this point we have our P4 program ready. Uh, let's try to compile and see if we have successful compilation or we missed something. Okay, so the compilation is successful. We have the basic.json output, which is the data plane specification that we're going to feed to the daemon. Um, before we do that, we want to make sure to push our file to the file system of the switch. So push to switch the file name, which is basic.json, and then the switch name, which is S1. The password here is password, all small caps. And now we have our uh, basic.json push to the switch. Okay. Next, we're going to verify the configuration. So uh, let's go now to mini edit. I will maximize mini edit. And there, um, I will open the terminal of the switch. Right. So right click on S1, hold the right click, and then we click on terminal. Now we are inside the terminal of switch S1. Um, always a good idea to check if the file was pushed successfully. So ls, we are listing the content, content uh, of the directory. We have the file there. And then we need to start the daemon, right? Now, keep in mind here, we have three interfaces, one for h1, one for h3, and one for the uh, link that is facing um, s2. So um, the way we start the daemon, as usual, simple switch dash i zero at s1 dash eth zero so we are mapping now port zero to the interface s1 eth zero dash i one at s1 eth one dash i two at s1 dash eth two 
Now, if you can see here, we didn't use the uh, nano log and specify the socket file uh, because we're not going to see anything in the logs, uh, but you can always do it. There is no problem with it. Um, and if you don't want to see the logs, you can just skip it as we are doing now. Then we specify the input to the daemon, which is the data plane specification. That, that was the output of the compiler, and we run it in the background. OK, three interfaces now added as port 0, 1, 2. And next, um, we're going to be populating the tables that are uh, used for forwarding. So remember that we told that the ingress was already written for us. It has a forwarding table. Right, and this is where the actual forwarding happens in the ingress. Uh, we didn't write that; it was already written for us. Uh, but we have to push the rules at runtime so that these tables are populated. And as usual, we'll use simple switch uh, underscore CLI, uh, and make sure to type in this command um, as it is. Right, so CLI should be capital here, and then we redirect to it as input lab five directory lab five and rules.cmd. So this is where our uh, forwarding rules are being listed in this rules.cmd file. OK, so now the table is populated. And there's nothing special here. All we are saying is um, if you are sending to host H1, use this output port. H3, use this output port. And either H2 or H4, use this output port. All right. Now. Um, now we need to test and verify the P4 program. But before we do that, uh, remember that we need to set the link uh, rate and we need to modify the buffer size or the queue size. And all of these are part of the simple switch CLI. So this is what Christian was asking before. How can we configure the traffic manager, the parameters of this uh, traffic manager? The first step is to go to the simple switch CLI. Um, we have to remember that this program is case sensitive. Yes, that's correct. Thank you, Thomas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, and so remember, we decided that we want to set the output rate here to be 100 megabits per second. And the way we do it in um, the simple switch CLI, we don't have anything that will allow us to specify it in rates right, uh, in bits per second, for example. Um, the, the default unit that you specify the rate with is in packets per second, okay? And if we want, let's say 100 megabits per second, we, we, want to achieve, we want to have this as our limit, right? So what we can do is we can assume that the packet size is 1500 bytes, right? And then if we divide the 100, divide the 100 megabits per second, by 12,000 uh, bits, which is basically 1,500 bytes multiplied by eight, then we can get roughly how many packets per second. And this uh, example here for 100 megabits per second and for an, uh, an MTU equals to 1,500 bytes, um, this is going to be equal to 8,333 uh, packets per second. OK, and this is what we have to type in whenever we um, configure the rate. So set underscore Q underscore rate. And then how many packets per second? In our case, this is going to be 8333. And that's it. Now we can, if we run a test, which we're going to do next, we're going to see that we set successfully the maximum rate of a certain uh, output port. So Ali, you might mm -hmm. want to clarify, you just said the rate at the E, I'm calling egress, but is the, the link between S1 and S2. Uh, uh -huh. and you are um, uh, setting the maximum of 100 megabits per second. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the rate of the uh, H3 S1 link so that people understand what is happening? Yeah, so the, the rates here from H1 to S1 and H3 to S1, these are unlimited. So um, when you create, um, when you have an interface in, in Linux, basically you don't have a limit by default on the rate. So if you try to push one gig, uh, you can push one gig if, if you don't have any bottleneck in your uh, route. So here, these links are unlimited. And basically this one is gonna be 
equals to 100 megabits per second. And, and for practical purposes, unlimited really is a 40, 50 gigabits per second. That's yeah. around the, 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 the roughly what, what you get if, if you push as much as possible, around 40. So mm -hmm. from 40 gig to uh, the capacity between S1, S2, 100 meg, clearly packets will start uh, building up in the queue. So that's mm -hmm. what you are doing here. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Um, so now we set the rate. The next thing we have to do is we need to set the buffer size uh, or the queue depth or the queue size on the switch S1. And to do it, there's a, another command, which is called set queue depth. So we also write it here, set queue depth. And then we write the value and I'll explain where we come up with that value. Um, so basically we have our uh, rate equals to 100 uh, megabits per second, right? So this is what we configured in the previous step. And then uh, typically a buffer size, the rule of thumb to configuring uh, a certain buffer and specify its size is to select it equals to one BDP. BDP stands for the bandwidth delay product. So uh, basically let's, if we assume that we have a delay of 20 milliseconds, and um, the rate is 100 megabits per second. If we do here the, the math, just by multiplying the rate and the delay, we get here the BDP, the bandwidth delay product. So this value is in bits. To convert it to bytes, we divide by eight. So we have 250 bytes. And then if we assume a 1500 bytes packet size, so we divide the 250,000 by 1500. This is going to give us roughly uh, 166 packets. Okay, so this is the value of one BDP. Again, if we assume that the link is 100 megabits per second, and we assume that the delay is 20 milliseconds. Delay here, for example, can be the propagation delay, the round trip time, for example. But, but uh, Eli, for, mm -hmm. for practical purposes, it could be anybody. If you want to have a buffer of 10 packets, you can do it. There is nothing that prevents you to do it. You are just following certain uh, best practices rules, best practice rules. Yeah, and exactly. And uh, what we are doing, we are not setting it actually to one BDP. We are setting, setting it to 10 BDP uh, just to make sure that the buffer is uh, large enough, right? And we can see the, the evolution of uh, how the packets are being enqueued in, into, the, into the buffer. So, um, Again, there's no reason why we set it to 10 BDP. You can set it to smaller, to larger. And the question of what is the right buffer size, this is along uh, a very old also research area. Um, if you have it too small, you will suffer from uh, packet drops. If you have it too high, you will suffer from additional delay. Uh, but for, for the sake of this lab, we're just setting it to 10 BDP just to show you how these values are going to be affected, the timestamps and the uh, queue depth that we're going to be reading directly from the P4. Okay. All right. So now uh, we have the configuration for the traffic manager ready. Uh, the next step is to start an hyper 3 server on the host H4. And uh, hyper 3 uh, I already mentioned, this is like a tool that will allow you to perform a throughput test to see uh, what is the amount of bits that you can push um, in a certain path, right? So uh, hyper 3 works in a client server way. So you would have a server started. This is gonna be here in our host H4. You can see it, see it here, host H4. And the way to start an hyper 3 server is to type in hyper 3 dash S, S for server. And now you will have a server waiting and listening for a port. The default port here is 5201, right? And the next step is to start the test, start the throughput test um, by uh, starting an hyper 3 client on the host H3, okay? So again, the throughput test would be from H3 to H4 here in one direction. And the direction is from left to right. So from H3 to H4. So right click on H3 to open its terminal. And then we will type in here, hyper 3 dash C. Dash C means that this device is gonna be an hyper 3 client and the server IP address is 10.0.0.4. This is where we just created our hyper 3 server here. 
and we press enter and we have now a test running by default it will uh, last for 10 seconds and what we can see here is um basically 10 intervals so every second we have one output that tells us how many bytes were transferred what is the bit rate so how many bits per second here we have um 96.4 megabits per second which is roughly uh close to whatever we set which is 100 megabits per second you can also see there are some retransmissions and um the congestion window which is a variable used in uh, tcp now uh the reason we have some retransmissions is uh, because this is a software switch. Um, you can't always have like a very clean path. The software switch is a, it tries as much as possible to perform the processing. Uh, usually the more resources you have, the better, uh, but it's still limited. It's not a production grade. And that's why you will still see some uh, retransmissions here. I would also say, Ali, that probably some of the retransmission might be because of the, I mean, the buffer will be full at, at a given time and the packet will be dropped. There's no more uh, sp uh, space in the buffer. Um, mm. Yeah. So you should expect some uh, packet drops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's correct. Um, all right, so now we verified that the... Um, Blink bandwidth is around 100 megabits per second. Um, next, what we're going to do is we're going to start probing. So um, remember that the probing will happen from H1 to H2, but because switch one and S2 are using this link, which is shared. So if this is being fully utilized, we should be able to see that in the probes that we sent from H1 to H2. So let's go ahead and uh, open a new terminal on host H2. And there, uh, we're just going to launch the script, receive.py, uh, specify uh, uh, the dash P, the protocol, a probe. Again, this is not a Linux program that is available. We just wrote the script just for displaying this custom protocol. And if you are interested in how they work, you can always open them. It's a Python script, and it uses CAPI. So you can see there uh, how, we, how you can create your own custom protocol there. Okay, I'll press on enter. And now we are waiting for packets to be received at host H2. Then let's start the probing from host H1. So we're gonna open a terminal on host H1, right click terminal. And then to start this probing protocol, we will use the send.py. Uh, we're gonna use the destination IP 10.0.0.2, which is the IP address of host H2. And then we can optionally here use a payload. And then we have to specify that this protocol is a probing protocol. Okay. So when we specify this dash P probe, the send.py will make sure to append after the IPv4 header, our custom protocol, right? Our custom headers that we created, the switch stats. And actually when we press enter and start sending packets, this is sending, um, indefinitely packets but what you can see this is the ip here the ip header the ipv4 header and you can see the queue statistics or the switch stats um, we have these five fields that we created and they are by default initialized to zero right uh, remember we are seeing them from the perspective of h1 so we are just creating these packets and pushing them to host h2 okay so at this point, if we go to host H2 to see what is happening, and you can see that uh, we have the switch ID equals to one. This is what this was written by our P4 switch, which we decided. And we can see the ingress and the egress timestamp. Now, remember that these are in um, microseconds, right? So let's say this first three microseconds, and then you have millisecond, and this is seconds. So this number here represents the um the time since the switch was started since the daemon was started okay and basically we are seeing the ingress timestamp the egress timestamp and we are seeing the time difference so the time difference here between these two is being always sent um between 200 300 or 400 uh, microseconds now this is because we are using a software switch uh in reality if you use like a um 
hardware switch, this should be much lower and should be in the order of nanosecond. And I also have to mention that those fields that we've seen in the standard metadata, typically in the hardware, they are expressed in nanoseconds and not microseconds. But the software switch has limitation and the best we can do is with the microseconds. Okay, and the time you see here, even though we don't have a queue, all right, so we're not sending packets that are uh, really fully utilizing the link and building up the queue, and we can verify this with the queue length equal to zero, but there's some processing time that is happening in the switch, and this is what we are seeing here, that's the time difference. Now, next what we're gonna do is we're gonna start pushing data again from H3 to H4. So we're gonna run this throughput test using iperf again. So I will maximize the uh, H3. And from there, I'm gonna repeat the same command, but this time I will run it for uh, 120 seconds or two minutes. So you can use that with the dash T option. And also I will use dash uh, uh, capital P 30. This means that I want to have 30 parallel streams or it's as if you have 30 uh, separate senders pushing, pushing at the same time. And the reason we are doing that is to make sure that we have a high load that will really fully utilize the, the, the link and will force the switch a queue to be uh, built up. Okay, so again, the P here is the parallel streams and 30 means I'm starting now 30 senders from this H3 to the uh, receiver H4. All right, so let's press on enter and we can see it started. Now the summation of all of them is 100 megabits. That's the link that we set. Uh, each one will have some different rate. But the interesting thing now is we, if we go to our um, host H2, right? Remember this is the device receiving the, the pro packets. And we can see that the time difference now went up to 200. Uh, it's the maximum would be 200 millisecond, right? That's the 10 BDP value we set for the Q size, right? Oh. But it's it keeps going up, uh, depends on the, the, the dynamics of these flows and how TCP works, but it's pushing data. And we are seeing here, what is the Q occupancy? And at the same time, we are seeing the Q length here in packets, right? So we can see here, for example, we have uh, 1100, 1200, sometimes 1300. And if you remember, we set that to, um, 1,666, right? So that's how much we can have at, at most, roughly at most, right? And so the idea here is to show you all this that are happening um, while the test is running and how the queue is being built up. And if we decide, let's say, to stop pushing packets, so I will use control C to stop this host H3. And you can see how immediately the time difference went down because we don't have any more queuing and the queue lengths went down to zero again. Okay. And there's another thing that I have to mention that before is powerful that's giving you these statistics, but also you can do it, you can do in much more granular. So what we're doing here, we are sending pro packets, right? Uh, but what you can do is you can also have um, this statistics, the queue statistics or the switch stats inserted on the original traffic, for example, the iperf traffic that was sent here. But we have to make sure that as these packets are leaving to the destination, we remove any headers that we uh, inserted. So if you if we consider that we have, let's say, switch one is before and switch two is before, right? And we have a collector somewhere, right? That's connected to S2, then we can add the queue occupancy at S1, we can add it at S2, and then, we cloned the packet, we sent it to the collector and we remove the switch stats so that we keep the packets as it was uh, originally sent from H3. Okay, so in other words, we can do per packet processing and we can have much more granularity in seeing the queue evolution. Such thing was never possible in any legacy devices. At, at best, you can use protocols such as SNMP uh, for pulling and seeing the queue stats, but it's very, very um, slow and you will get uh, measurements in the order of tens of seconds rather than having for each packet. And um, also here we have ping. So if we, we didn't show that, but if we run the test again to have the queue being utilized and let's say we wanna show 
how ping is now showing us the round trip time. So ping 10.00.4, you can see that this uh, also is affecting the round trip time, right? So the queuing delay that we are seeing in the, uh, or inserted by the P4 switch is also reflected in the round trip time because at the end, those ping packets are being sent and uh, received at S1, which is busy. And this is gonna be adding the queuing delay and increasing the round trip time. Okay. Yeah, Italo has a good observation. In other words, it's quite easy to do an in-band network telemetry with any desirable granularity. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Do you guys recommend references about congestion and queue management at the switches for some real switches? Switch hardwares, the queue utilization reports are not as obvious as we would expect compared to the example and Matt Ellie just presented. Um, Ellie, do you have any observation about that? I'm trying to uh, um, give some input here. I would say, like, if if um, if you really want to learn about uh, queuing disciplines or all this queue management, uh, uh, what is the math behind it? What is the right uh, or what are good values to set for the buffer size, the rates? We have another library called Network Tools and Protocols. It has twenty. Um, practical labs, like the one that we are doing, and it explains really in details uh, everything you need to know from um, emulating traffic conditions, uh, setting uh, links, setting buffer sizes, uh, set, uh, tuning the end host so that you can achieve full, uh, um, full throughput, uh, also AQM. And um, another thing is if you are interested in um, the P4 related work, Jose here also, uh, which is one of the graduate students. He recently published a paper that has all the works that try to use TCP and buffering and queuing uh, with before. So you can also take a look at that. Um, yeah, Jose, would you would you please uh, uh, share the URL uh, of the paper? So uh, sure. for Italo, but the... but that's uh, relevant. Um, is uh, I think you have one section that talk about uh, what Italo was suggesting. Yes, uh, with, utilization. Absolutely, we talk about the schemes that uh, implements AQM on P4 and some other work related works as well. Thank you, and, Italo. Yeah, and also if you want uh, like more uh, theoretical parts in addition to the hands-on labs, uh, there's this here uh, the book that we published recently that has basically all the labs, but at the same time, more theory uh, for the labs. So it will describe a little bit more about uh, what are the tools and the properties that you see in the networks today. It might be also useful to have the reference. There is a very uh, famous protocol, uh, congestion control protocol, that is using the in-band telemetry. Um, I forget, HPCC, I believe it is. Yeah. Um, so that's a very nice uh, example of how to use in-band network telemetry. So it's worth putting also in the uh, chat window, Jose, so HPCC. Uh, Christian, do you have any observation? Uh, yes, I, I, I have a question. Um, what could be an advantage of using a prof packets instead of per packet processing or per packet telemetry. Um, can you repeat again, Christian? I just want to make sure that I got your question correctly. Okay. So uh, what um, could be an advantage uh, to use prof packets instead of uh, per packet processing? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, if, if you're talking about granularity and the precision, there is no um, uh, there's no advantage really because probing is basically you are sending a lot of packets and you are seeding them. Uh, but it means that you are seeing the queue um, considering that you are not really 
performing the these operations on the actual traffic so you are sending additional traffic right now the advantage might be uh, only that it's about more simplistic simplic simplicity right uh, because you can define your own protocol and just send it and assume that you wrote your p4 switch as well and you will see them but usually the per packet is better in terms of uh in terms of uh, precision however you always have a trade-off of also the the overhead <coughs> excuse me so do you really want to push or to send to create copies of all the packets to a collector sometimes it might not be feasible with high rates so you might want to just do some selection of these uh, headers and send them and probe in this specific example would be useful because probe will not be uh, creating a lot of overhead like uh, when you operate on a per packet basis so you have always the accuracy and the overhead. There's this trade-off. Um, you want more accuracy, then you have to work on more packets. You want less overhead, then just use like probe and use less packets to, to infer. Okay, Ali, thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. And um, by the way, Jose, you might want to share also the URL of the, the same article, but that is in, in the website. Um, because uh, uh, some might not be able to access to uh, the article through Elsevier. So sure. could you please share the one that is open access? Um, all right, so I think we are on time and we will have our first uh, break of the day right now. Thank you, Lee, for that presentation. Um, Thank you. So, we will have a 10 minute break. We will be back at uh, uh, 10 37 um, Pacific time. So put here. And we will have our second hands on session of the day. All right, so I think we are ready. Okay. Um, okay, thank you, um, Jorge. So uh, it's been very interesting three, uh, three, four days. I've been learning a lot in the background as well. Um, so a bit of my background is that I do machine learning on networking data, and I work with traditional networking statistics like NetFlow, SFlow, TCP kind of stuff. And uh, we're hoping to transition from those traditional ways into the way P4 does so that we can get much more granular machine learning uh, done. Um, so the topic which uh, we put together was, uh, we looked at what are the current applications in the industry and what people are doing. And we kind of did like a summary of slides just to um, inspire you guys and also to have some sort of a discussion on what kind of machine learning you could do on the P4's uh, work which you guys are doing. Um, so hopefully this should take around uh, uh, half an hour. Um, so yeah, so the outline which we're going to be presenting is where first, uh, not a lot of people know what machine learning is. So we have like some very basic slides into describing what machine learning is and how we use it in networking experiments. Um, so for that, I have an introduction of what AI and machine learning is, uh, some of the techniques and the libraries used and some things which you should think about when you're writing your machine learning algorithms. Uh, examples of the three main machine learning tasks which you can do, which includes regression, classification, and uh, control kind of applications. And how do you actually measure the accuracy of a machine learning model if you build one? Uh, it's actually very, very easy. There's a lot of examples on the web. Um, so I'm hoping that with that precursor, you guys should be able to get a machine learning model done in like five minutes. Um, examples of how we're using machine learning in networks. So I like put it into the way of where, when I start describing machine learning and highlight of how deep learning and network explorations kind of like uh, fits into that. 
And then after that, we'll uh, do like a mini question break, and then we'll have much more P4 experiments in the second part of this uh, presentation. Um, so before we begin, um, the, the general question is, what is artificial intelligence? So um, a lot of people are from, especially when we talk about CS backgrounds, uh, CS actually does teach us a lot of about artificial intelligence. Um, so some people who then go ahead and specialize in networking have kind of this idea. Um, but if you've traditionally gone into networking, then you don't look at certain topics like AI. Um, so believe it or not, AI was actually birthed or born in 1950 when Alan Turing wrote this paper called Can Machines Think? Um, and basically what he did was he posts, the paper is titled Can Machines Think? And he poses this Turing test where if you start talking to a machine, you don't know whether it's human or not. Um, recently, I think two days ago, there was a story about this Google engineer who came out and said that his program has developed feelings. So he's actually alluding to the Turing test that you cannot make out that the computer program is human or not. Um, and the idea is that if you succeed in that, then basically you've achieved AI. And that's like a big problem in computer science right now. Not a lot of people have actually uh, concretely said that they've, they've succeeded at the Turing test. That's why Google kind of like took a step back straight away when, when the news broke. Uh, so it was an interesting article to read if people are interested. It just happened like two or three days ago. Um, so the basic definition of AI is when machines can start in, uh, exhibiting intelligent behavior. And intelligence means different things. Um, so this, again, goes back to what Turing test is. Um, so the difference, you hear these three terms regularly, AI, ML, DL, um, so deep learning, machine learning, AI, uh, the, 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 everything is basically one big field, um, which is artificial intelligence being, being started in the 1950s. And then you had a number of machine learning algorithms which came out in the 1980s, such as spam filters or um, the old traditional, when I was very young, very young uh, playing chess on a Windows machine, for example. So that used AI in the background as well. Um, and now in 2010s, uh, there was like this major, major hardware advancements in GPUs and HPC processing, which allowed you to process very massive AI algorithms, which were particularly deep learning neural networks in, in finite amount of time. And that really had a breakthrough in machine learning um, from, from that on. And that's why we see more and more deep learning kind of applications being, being discussed. But there are other intelligent machine learning algorithms as well, which people have used, uh, such as expert systems, um, uh, et cetera. And people have had very good successes with that. So you can go into those areas as well. Um, so uh, machine learning is regularly being used in our, in our days. So for example, HR uses it for sorting CVs when you apply for a job. So remember to put in your keywords over there so that your CV gets selected when you apply for jobs. Um, because they use computer systems behind the scenes uh, to read those CVs. Um, so I mentioned GPU and HPC processing because now it allows you to process very massive amounts of data in finite time. And uh, more and more commercial applications are the ones really driving this change. So for example, image or speech recognition, uh, such as in self-driving cars, is mainly driven by machine learning. Um, so that's really why you hear so much about machine learning in the last few uh, five to 10 years. Um, so there are various categories of machine learning algorithms. Uh, there are knowledge-based uh, algorithms, which mean rule-based or expert systems, as I mentioned, that if this, this happens, then do this, and you can have like very massive if and then conditions to do that. Then you have probabilistic machine learning, uh, which are kind of like Bayesian networks where you use probabilities to make decisions. Um, and fuzzy systems are, are very good examples of these. And then the much more commonly used today, deep learning methods fall under data-driven reasoning, where you can either do supervised versus unsupervised or semi-supervised techniques. Um, so the, all of these, I'll explain what they are. Um, but basically you use data to actually infer a machine learning model straight from the data. So you don't start from top 
to bottom, but bottom to up. And then you can build bespoke machine learning algorithms for the data set you are working for. Um, so this is uh, what, where deep learning has really become very powerful than the traditional uh, top, to, top to bottom kind of machine learning methods. Um, so uh, we mentioned supervised versus unsupervised. And the difference is that you have the access of labeled versus unlabeled data. Um, and what kind of data is available. So I'm gonna go into the details of that yellow box uh, in the next few slides. So, um, so why deep learning? Um, so for example, um, most of the examples on the web is that you are training a deep learning model to recognize cats. Um, so for example, um, you basically give it a bunch of images and then you give it a label that this is a cat so that when it sees another image in the future, it can recognize that it's a cat or a dog, for example. Um, so that comes under object identification and self-driving cars are using it to identify pedestrians on the road or other cars on the road. So they, they build a box around your image and then they identify that that's the object. Um, you could also use it for playing games. Uh, this is the famous AlphaGo experiment where uh, they trained a deep learning model to actually be performing better than a human. So it derived better strategies to win a game. And uh, computer gamers uh, among us are, are very, um, are very uh, equipped with these kind of techniques because you're always trying to learn how to beat a game and get a higher score every time you play a game. Um, so again, all of these are data-driven techniques. You can collect all these data and tag it, and then run a neural network behind the scenes to build these folk solutions. And that's where uh, I'm hoping that you guys can think about the P4 data, which you are going to be uh, generating, or the massive amount of granularity, which you will be having. You can actually build these folk network solutions based on those kind of data sets. So uh, we mentioned supervised and unsupervised. So supervised learning is basically when labeled data is available. Uh, this is a massive challenge in networks, as you know, but there are ex examples where labeled data is, is easy to find. So for example, in this particular case, uh, we did a number of TCP experiments where uh, we made sure that the network was all healthy and we did a TCP transfer. And then we were able to collect all of those TCP statistics and log them as normal. Uh, then in another uh, experiment, what we did was we purposely introduced loss, packet duplication, or reordering uh, using artificial synth uh, synthetic techniques. And then again, we did the same experiment and you can uh, collect TCP statistics and then label them as anomalous TCP statistics. Um, so these two sets of data sets, when we got them, we did a principal component analysis, which is basically just a visualization technique in machine learning, uh, which takes all of those features and groups them into a two by uh, a, a, a two, two into two grid kind of a visualization, as you see here, um, as a vector. And all the normal flows, uh, which we had collected, called on, for, uh, in this particular case, fell under one part of the graph and all the abnormal went into the other. Part. So this shows you like a very good picture of what a good versus a bad flow on a bad network would, would kind of look like. And you can use these kind of examples to do classification or object detection or anomaly detection. Uh, so as soon as something falls in the left part of the graph, you can tag it as an anomaly, even if you don't know in the future and it doesn't have a label because you've pre-trained your machine learning classifier to identify that boundary between the normal and the abnormal. Um, so these are examples where supervised learning is very, uh, very strong because it works with labeled data, um, which you can use to train your machine learning before you actually do real experiments as well. Um, in another case is where no labels are available, um, which is what our everyday lives are like. Um, so these are unsupervised learning techniques and Basically, what happens is that you uh, take all of the data and you try to make sense of it. it. You try to make sense that whether there are specific clusters being formed, and then you do an infer that, okay, I see these clusters, so that's going to be the normal and that's going to be the abnormal. 
Um, so here, what you're trying to do is basically learn the underlying rules of the data. So for example, in this particular graph over here, uh, this is again a TCP flow um, a graph, which is plotted in a 3D, uh, a 3D kind of a visualization with TSNI machine learning visualization techniques. And the only label data I had here was the day of the week. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all the way up to Sunday. And when I, when I put all of those colors together in this particular graph, you see that there are no distinguishing clusters formed over here. So I cannot uh, identify the boundary between good or bad, or even between a weekday or a weekend over here, because everything is on top of each other. Um, so this is kind of like what machine learning problems are like, uh, because sometimes initially when you look at the data, you're actually not, not seeing anything sensible from there. Um, if I was able to see very nice clusters, then I would have had some features identified, but this means that I need to go ahead and do some further analysis over here. So what we did was we, uh, we took this and we then applied Gaussian mixture models on top of this particular technique. And then we were able to come up with these kind of clusters uh, shown at the bottom over here, uh, which showed these orange versus blue in the same data set. And we found this one particular cluster which, which fell on the right side of the graph. Uh, and then once you find that, then you go into the data and see why are these particular clusters falling on the right side of the graph versus the rest of the data. And then what we found was that these particular flows were all the flows that were happening during the COVID, um, COVID shutdowns had just started. So, and because this was TCP flow, uh, we were considering the date, uh, the day of the week and the time at which the transfers were happening. And we found that during the initial shutdown periods, a lot of the scientists were actually uh, running their experiments in the night or during the midnight. And that's why some of the clusters were really far away from the normal behavior of the rest of the network, uh, which was found initially. Um, so this was like a kind of like a good experiment. These are the kind of experiments which you can do and then take up to management and say, see, even the working patterns of the scientists have changed. So maybe we need to do something to actually make lives easier for them uh, to do networks at that particular time of the day. Um, so this was uh, one of the examples of unsupervised learning. Um, and another third final case is in reinforcement learning. So this is when you have no data available at all. Um, so what happens in this kind of a situation is that you have the environment, or in our case, it would be the network, and you introduce an agent over here, which is constantly trying out different techniques against the environment. So in a gaming environment, you can think about you being the player and you're constantly learning how to play the game and you're trying out different actions to see which one is getting the best reward. So you read in the state of the game, uh, which is basically where the game and where everything is. So in our case, a state is networking statistics, which you are taking a snapshot of what the network is looking like at that time. You do changes in the network, and then you collect a reward against what you've, uh, what you've done. And uh, over time, you can then learn what the best strategy was given a particular condition in the network. Um, so especially when you have no data to start with, you're basically learning through trial and error. Um, so this particular technique is something which we are looking at with SDN controllers. So we can introduce this agent as an SDN controller, and then the controller can try out different uh, network topologies, uh, not network topologies, but network paths across the same topology. And then over different times of the day, it learns like what the best path is for me to send certain traffic and you can, you can do more active steering of the traffic uh, once that is successful. Um, so some of the common machine learning tasks are regression where you are trying to predict values into the future. Uh, so for example, uh, taking us as examples uh, as humans, if we have a particular pattern weekly, we can then predict what the next week is gonna look like. So we try to do that in network traffic as well. We take in statistics from network traffic and we try to predict what the network traffic is gonna look like in the future. So that's regression. And there are various machine learning algorithms like Gaussian, Poisson, linear graphs, which can help you do that. Uh, in classification, we mentioned supervised and unsupervised classifications. 
Um, so you can basically group data into classes and categories uh, using neural networks or decision trees, like in the example over here, where they have plants and they're grouping them into flowering and non-flowering uh, uh, branches. Or you could do clustering where you are basically learning the underlying rules in a data set which doesn't have labels and you partition the data into clusters. Uh, so k-means is a very easy way to get started with this and it's a very easy technique to understand as well. Um, so neural networks, nearest neighbor algorithms, all of these help you understand uh, unsupervised clusters uh, in your data sets. Um, I'll go through this and then I'll uh, stop for a question. So, um, how, uh, so we mentioned about training a machine learning algorithm and then using it for actual work on the network. So the way uh, this works is it works in two ways. You have a bunch of data which you've collected. Um, maybe it has labels, maybe it doesn't have labels, but assume that it has labels. And then you extract, you you use the machine learning algorithms, which are mentioned over here, and then you train the machine learning algorithm based off of the data which, uh, which you have. So for example, I could do a k-means on TCP flow analysis, and I've now trained a k-means classifier on the TCP uh, data which I've collected. Once this is done, you basically save the machine learning algorithm which you have. Then is the time where you start using it for prediction, which is the second part of the experiment. So now you've got this trained machine learning algorithm over here. A new data set arrives or a new TCP flow arrives. You run this through the pre-classified model and the classifier model will basically just label what it thinks it is. Does it fall on the left side of the graph or the right side of the graph? Um, so this is, in very, very basic what a machine learning algorithm is doing. This is why you have pre-training and then you have the prediction phase, which is also called the inference phase in a machine learning technique. Um, most of the time in a, when you start doing these experiments, you would notice that the training phase is the one which takes hours and hours and hours, especially if you're training on large data sets and more complex machine learning algorithms. But the prediction or the inference part usually takes a split second. Um, so usually there's a lot of literature and how you can optimize the training part because they know that the prediction part is going to take very small time. Uh, I'm going to stop for any questions. Do, is, does anybody have any questions at this point? Don't see. Okay. Um, so, um, so these are uh, the various examples of machine learning algorithms which exist. Um, it purely depends on what your, uh, your favorites are, but you can actually choose a bunch of them and then start doing all of your experiments using those as, uh, as, as you go forward. Um, mostly people choose algorithms based on the data that is available and also the problem that is being explored. So for example, I mentioned k-means and principal component analysis are very good for unsupervised techniques. But then if you do have labeled uh, data, you would go down decision trees, for example, uh, just to start off. Uh, but bear in mind that uh, some machine learning algorithms give you 50% accuracy compared to 80%, compared to 90%. This is still an open challenge. And I'm very surprised that a lot of machine learning papers um, are basically, they take a bunch of data sets and they run five or six machine learning algorithms and they just show a bar graph of the different accuracies which is coming across the different models, but they, do, they have no explanation on why this is happening. And those papers get accepted. Um, so always have a think about why certain machine learning algorithms are performing at different accuracies and what can you do to actually improve the accuracy of the, of the model which you are working with? Um, because as researchers, we always want to explore the whys of, of like six different types of why certain things are happening. Um, then it comes to, um, so I mentioned accuracy. So this is very important for you to validate uh, your machine learning model. And accuracy is basically, the formula is the number of correct predictions divided by the total number of predictions. Um, so uh, this is called the, um, 
the true the true positives, the true negatives, and those kind of techniques, that's what activist means. So for example, in this particular case, uh, I'm classifying flows over the network, and I try it, tried out three different uh, models of classifiers over here using random forest, extra trees, and gradient boosted regression techniques. All of these data sets, uh, sorry, all of these codes are available online through scikit-learn. So all you have to do is import that library, uh, push your data to it, and then get those um, outputs. If you don't want to do like extra tuning of those algorithms, you can get some initial results straight away. Um, and then we also tried a reinforcement uh, recurrent neural network technique, which is not shown here. It took like three days to finish training the data, um, but it gave you just 70% of accuracy. So that actually did not perform as better as these simpler algorithms were, where the random forest, for example, gave up gave, gave us up to 98% accuracy. So how are these um, uh, things done is that you take your whole data set, which you have, and you chunk it up into two or three, um, three parts. So you take 50% of that data for your training part. And this is what you will be using in the first part of your machine learning technique, where you are determining the features and you're training the machine learning model. Then you can take the rest of it and use it as your test data, because this is the unseen data which the machine learning model has seen. And then you measure the accuracy based on what the test data is giving you. You can also do a uh, part of this is to also do validation. So you see this in the neural network models where they chunk, they take a chunk to validate the training model, which, uh, which is there. This is just to do model tuning and like improving the error rate. And again, in the end, you should throw it the test data, which is the inference part, which I mentioned before. And then you use that to measure the accuracy of your machine learning algorithms. Uh, usually researchers just chunk it into train and test. They don't do validate. It's, you wouldn't be penalized if you don't do validate. Uh, you could try it out and see whether it makes a difference to your machine learning accuracy. Um, so basically what happens is you do these, uh, you do these, uh, you do a bunch of these tests with different machine learning algorithms. For example, in this particular case, I see that the random part classifier is giving me the best accuracy. So in my further experiments, I'm going to take that particular classifier and then build all of my experiments around the random forest classifier. And then this helps me choose which particular technique I'm using uh, to do machine learning on my, on my kind of uh, problems. So scikit-learn is the machine learning library I mentioned where a lot of this is already available and free to use. And it's good for people who want to start machine learning very quickly as well. They come with lots of examples as well. Um, there are uh, Jupyter notebooks, which you can write, um, import the scikit-learn, and basically just, just try it out. You get the graph straight in the Jupyter notebook. In, uh, for people who are much more interested in more complex machine learning algorithms, there are four very famous ones uh, which people are using for doing neural network performances in their machine learning. Uh, TensorFlow and Torch are the ones which you hear about the most now because TensorFlow is being driven by Google and Torch uh, by, um, by Facebook or Meta. Um, in my experiences, Torch actually performs a lot better than TensorFlow. So, um, so it's, it's, these are also libraries which are out there and you can use these to write much more complex neural networks and also try it out in your work. Um, so for example, uh, we're gonna go into a case study here where we're gonna explore some important features in NetFlow uh, data, uh, just to work you through how we use machine learning. Um, so in this particular case, we're doing a supervised machine learning technique. Um, I mentioned the COVID examples we did. So we took NetFlow data from January 1st of 2020 to March 15, 2020 and then March 16, 2020 to June 15, 2020 as post-COVID. And March 15th uh, is basically the, March 16th was the day the stay-at-home orders were issued in California. So that's why we divided the data set uh, based on this pre-COVID and post-COVID. So you can uh, look at the kind of features that were in our data set. So we were using NetFlow data. So we had TCP, UDP, ICMP data, 
Uh, we had bytes inbound, outbound, packet count, uh, unique servers, uh, inbound, outbound, recorded hourly, and then unique port numbers also recorded hourly. So all of our records basically had these features, and then we, again, labeled them as pre-COVID and post-COVID to find uh, two clusters or see what are the difference between the two clusters. Um, so we tried a number of algorithms, decision trees, random forest. You could do initial for a principal component analysis, TSNI, uh, et cetera, as well. Uh, these are the results of our TSNI analysis. Um, so those data sets, which we did, we basically just plotted them out in a TSNI graph. Uh, again, this is a function which is available through scikit-learn. And you see that the, there are some post-COVID over here, uh, but mostly you get a very clear outline of post-COVID clusters uh, in this graph. And visually, this is very appealing, uh, but also this is something very nice, which uh, you, can help, you can see that there is something very, very unique happening in the post-COVID data sets um, that actually pushes those clusters uh, apart. So you can do a 2D visualization as we have here, or you could do a 3D visualization as we have at the bottom over here. Um, and sometimes it's not very clear to see a unique cluster in 3D visualization. There are, maybe it is by, by you twisting the graph around. Um, so those are the things which I wanted to mention that try out different visualizations in your data sets to see if you can actually see these kind of uh, flows. Um, so we summarize those network, net flow records in hourly and we use that as our data sets. Um, and then we did a bunch of few rounds. So TSNI allows you to optimize the clusters when you are running the algorithm. Uh, so we did a bunch of rounds until we got very nice clusters as you see over here. Um, so we had a loop going over here. So these are examples on what you can do with some of the data sets which you are collecting. Uh, and then once you have that, you can basically apply a decision tree to see what are the important features that are coming out in the clusters if you don't want to go through the data set yourself. Uh, so a decision tree uh, is very simple. It basically takes your data set and it starts partitioning the data into left and right. So if your salary is between 50K and 80K, yes, it goes to the left. If no, you go to the right. And then you can keep partitioning the data based on that. And decision tree uh, algorithms allow you to do this all automatically on the data set which you give it. Um, so it uses a bunch of maths called the Gini index, which allows it to calculate the root over here, which I'm not going into the detail. Um, but it is out there for maths to, uh, to learn. And basically what you do is you prune the tree to get what the identified classes are. So for example, in this case, you see that there are two classes identified the accepted offer and the declined offer. So you can do the same thing on the two clusters, which we found here, the pre and the post COVID. And this is what it comes out with. Uh, this basically gives us all the rules on why the pre and the post look like. So the class zero is identified as the pre COVID over here, which is given in orange. And the post COVID is identified as, as one in blue. So just this simple decision tree is allowing you to see what are the rules that end up going into the blue cluster versus the orange cluster. And we found that um, particularly the unique port numbers are the ones, the, the kind of rules which really push the data to go into the post, post, um, post cluster, which basically means that a lot of people were actually logging in from home so we got new server port numbers and IDs which were not seen before in the pre-COVID era. And that's why these two different clusters were formed in the data set which we, which we saw. Um, this could lead to overfitting and bias in the results. So bear in mind that, but from, from an initial point of view, this is very nice to actually identify, especially if you're working with very large big data sets that you could actually use these techniques and you don't have to do this manually. And that's where machine learning is really nice because you can actually uh, automate a lot of these techniques. Um, so in conclusion to this particular part, um, we are very much driven by this quote from Nick Beamster um, and Jennifer Rex Rexford who talk about this in their paper, why and how networks should 
on themselves, they basically make a case that networks should learn to drive themselves. Um, uh, this has been a point of, uh, uh, people have debated over this for the last five, six years, but I see much more of an acceptance now of machine learning being brought to networks because there are techniques like P4 and programmable networks out there now, which weren't there so, so evident like, like five years ago. Especially when you have simple actions, such as improving availability, tackling resilience and dealing with scales, those are techniques which you can upload to machine learning techniques and then put it into a programmable network. So the way it works is, uh, this is a, a, a diagram which I kind of make sense of how this is gonna work. You have all of your network, which is represented by three routers and switches over here. And you're collecting all of this network telemetry, which is coming into this particular box. That network telemetry is now data set with which you could do supervised or unsupervised classification to do those clusters analysis or anomaly detection. You could do forecasting, predict what the telemetry is gonna look like in the future and make decisions based on that. Then is the, uh, the reinforcement learning part. So you can actually train a neural network afterwards or put it into an AI agent, which can then use this information to do an action onto the network. Um, such as execute control. Uh, so because now we have SDN control over the networks, you can have these northbound APIs, which allows you to communicate with the SDN controller below. So that AI agent can then have those northbound APIs to communicate with the devices which you have underneath. And then based on what it does, it collects a reward function. So eventually over time, you can program as SDN controller to actually try out different actions in the network and learn to improve its behavior. We have been doing this with, um, with Hecate is, is a controller which we are trying, which, are, which we are building in the background over here, which is learning of how to optimize traffic engineering, such as to do load balancing and remove congestion in the future. Um, so those are techniques which we are working on. And there is so many, so many more ideas which you guys would probably have you would want to work on as well. Um, so it's an open challenge and um, uh, really excited to see what kind of things would you come up with. So as a summary, um, this is an interesting software and hardware fusion challenge. Uh, we mentioned about the deep learning trend which has happened. Uh, that started in 2011 with the CATS videos. And then that led to the AlphaGo experiment which happened in 2016. So we're actually not very far away, we're in 2022. Uh, the hardware acceleration, um, FPGAs are particularly becoming very, very common these days. A lot of experiments are happening in with that. Um, and especially with P4, um, Topino boards, maybe uh, Jorge might have something to add over here. Uh, industry and academic efforts like Barefoot are looking into this as well. Um, Juniper is really pushing the self-driving network as well. Uh, with introducing AI at the control plane. So this is also something interesting to look at. Um, academia, for some reason, is more concentrated on looking at TCP and traffic patterns and using AI on that. Uh, but the, these are interesting challenges which people can, can start looking into further and uh, do more interesting work. Um, so uh, I'm going to stop and ask Jorge to add something over here before we take a take a question break and go into the second round. Thank you, Marian. Um, let's see if there is any question, observation. I don't see any, I have some. Um, I'm not a, an expert in machine learning, so certainly it's a, I'm learning from your presentation. Um, is there a, as far as I know, uh, machine learning being used in production networks today? Uh, for example, at ESNet? So, um, so what we've, so there is, a, there is a challenge over there. So we have built, like for example, we've built a tool called NetPredict, which takes in SNMP data and predicts what congestion is gonna look like in the future. Um, and we built this as a service and we've given it to the engineers they choose to look at it and not to look at it. So what we've learned is that engineers are very, very set in the way they've been traditionally doing things. 
that sometimes it's difficult for them to look at how these new techniques might be used. Um, so I found that um, in ESNet, uh, there is, a, there is a, maybe over the next few years, they would be much more convinced, uh, especially with the Hecate work. But industry is really pushing this. So for example, um, Thousand Eyes, a very famous monitoring um, thing, they've started putting in machine learning clusters to identify problems on the network. So it kind of like highlights it. Um, so they probably use it in their production systems. Uh, Juniper is trying to put it in their production systems. Um, yeah, so there are some industry efforts which are really pushing this forward. All right, it, it sounds uh, to some extent similar with the T4, uh, you, you mentioned network engineers sometimes are, uh, are more careful. Uh, that's what I see in campus networks with P4. Uh, there was not gonna be a transition uh, from one day to another. I mean, they, it has to be slow and, and the technology has to mature. Um, any, any observation? <clears throat> Also, you mentioned that uh, you are applying machine learning using NetFlow data. And um, in our experience, we, we have been done some NetFlow in the past, uh, particularly I did that on a campus network. Um, Sometimes NetFlow is not that accurate, at least the, using the equipment that we use. And we use commercial equipment that was uh, Cisco routers. Um, how do you see uh, using uh, the very precise telemetry? Uh, do you see that it's going to be a, a very a much better result? Uh, how do you see P4 plus machine learning, and and where that is where is the space for P4 and machine learning? Yeah, good question. So, um, so one of the challenges in NetFlow is that uh, the way the data is reported is that. It's, it's a very dumb way of recording data because it, you could give it like every 30 seconds to do a data dump. And there could be flows that have been there in the network for a long time. So you see those flows repeated even in the dump, which comes out every 30 seconds. And that's why sometimes the data is not very accurate. So you need to do some cleaning of the data before you can do some machine learning on it. Um, I see that P4 could actually remove this problem because it could do much more precision kind of telemetry. You could have much more uh, rule-based uh, uh, packet tagging that when you see certain kinds of tags uh, or flows, you basically save. So you can have much more precision telemetry. Um, that could seriously uh, improve the accuracy of the machine learning you do on it uh, and also the results which you take from it. So which are not possible in the current way we do network monitoring because network monitoring right now is very dumb. Um, and mainly because it's like, because we deal with massive amounts of data. Right, right. Very interesting. Uh, any, any questions, other observations? Well, thank you very much, Marianne. Um, so, Okay, so we have uh, a few slides which we put together for P4 examples of what machine learning um, is happening. So I'll, I'll start to wrap this up. Um, so over the last four days, um, you guys have been learning how to do, or I'm also learning with you, how to do P4 language specifications, how to write mark or match target cases, and basically to do very interesting how-tos. Um, uh, we also discussed these use cases as well. So particularly the one which we mentioned, I kind of have it as a summary over here. So I've been looking at uh, P4 literature in the background. P4 does these workshops every year. Uh, and I've been looking at what kind of industry applications have started looking at machine learning with P4. So we summarized all of these here just to, again, uh, inspire you guys to come up with new ideas. Um, so the reason why P4, uh, Jorge kind of alluded to it when he talked about NetFlow comparisons. It's basically, I see this as four major things. You get flexibility on the network. You're actually building programmable networks. Uh, you can have uh, like per flow uh, actions you can do. So that's flexible. You can um, improve the costs because now it's a programmable thing. You don't have to buy a bespoke hardware for one particular job. Um, it's faster. 
um, because especially if it's built on an FPGA board, you can actually have split second reaction times and it's efficient as well in the long run. So all of this together actually helps us build a bespoke network. So for example, I can build a bespoke network for AT&T versus another kind of network for ESNet, um, which is basically based on the data and the flows which they, these two networks see because they are very different the way uh, these two networks behave. So think about all of these things which P4 allows you to do. So one of the examples which um, students have been discussing over the last two days is a new flow arrives and you can have match actions on what to do with it. So this particular example is from the P4 website where uh, a particular flow, they have these taps set up on the network and whenever a certain flow satisfies a particular rule, they basically mirror the traffic onto another P4 device. So then they can do so much more analysis on that kind of telemetry, which they are collecting on the mirrored traffic. Um, so this is the high precision telemetry, which you can collect from P4. Um, another example from another uh, project. So ESNet has a project called Q Factor, and they've been looking at inbound telemetry and what kind of things which they can do. So in this particular experiment, they're doing TCP analysis. So they have a TCP flow, which goes from one point to the other. And every time they write a header on top of the, the flow as it moves towards, towards the end. In the end, they can collect all of those telemetries and actually track the path which the TCP flow took uh, and also do much more in-depth uh, in telemetry collection on or analysis on the data which was collected which was collected. Uh, so they're doing this to analyze what kind of TCP flows are in the network. So these are the kind of examples which they are uh, looking at. Um, so for example, they can do packet per packet rates reaching 10 gig uh, from the sender link. Uh, they can also do average rates from, because it's massive amounts of data. So you need to come up with innovative ways on how you can actually get, make sense out of the data that is there. Um, this was a particularly big challenge for them because of the amount of data which is being collected at, at uh, someone mentioned that you can actually do it at much more finer granular. Um, the challenge that it brings is a very interesting software challenge because now you have this massive amount of data and you need some more efficient data processing ways in which you can handle that. Um, some of the ways in which you can do is you can actually, if you're uh, cloud users, you can actually build streaming pipelines on, on cloud, but you can also build your own streaming pipelines using, using RabbitMQs or some of your own, own internal servers if you have them connected to your system, and then you can start analyzing these data sets as they start coming in. Um, so the other example which Qflow also did was they looked at IPERF flows and then they compared uh, what happens when the two flows kind of uh, collide with each other. Does the performance of one flow go down, uh, particularly in terms of throughput and uh, packet loss, for example. Um, so they were able to collect much more finer granularity data based, based on that. Um, so these two particular flows, which I mentioned, they were comparing the performance of the BBR with the qubit. And they, show, they saw that whenever both the flows were running at the same time, um, they saw that the BBR interpacket timing was much more widespread in congestion control than TCP qubit, especially when loss was happening on, on the network. So, um, so the whole idea is that we're trying to build a predict toward, going, going towards a predictable network in ESNet. So, um, the common approaches which we've been done, sorry, my cat's just woken up. Um, the common approaches that we've been working on is like looking at NetFlow, SNMP, Parksoner, and TCP statistics. Um, but now you have more access to the four kind of data sets which you are collecting. So some of the examples from industry applications are, uh, they're doing this to check their paths or trace the paths that, for example, if an SDN didn't reconfigure are the flows flowing correctly based on the new path which is being done? And you can see from the diagrams which we showed, you can actually do a, a path tracing kind of an experiment. 
Uh, this is very useful for ECMP kind of challenges where you're doing hot checking problems. In another way, you're also collecting massive amounts of measurements. So you can build much more nicer regression or network prediction techniques, such as predicting what the throughput is gonna look like in the future. You could do classification on the data. So the example of using uh, BBR versus qubit, you can also build classifier or cluster models where you can basically take TCP statistics and try to identify what kind of a TCP congestion algorithm is running in the model uh, at that time. And there has been an example where they've built these using LSD models. Or you could use this to also find anomalies in the network. Where in the network is the problem happening when you are running networks? So again, think about all of these. These are all passive analysis where you're basically uh, doing a mirroring of the traffic and then you're identifying the traffic which you've been collecting. Uh, I'm also interested in doing much more active analysis, which I'm trying to learn through this particular week where attending this course with you guys. Um, but you can also think about what kind of other ideas which are coming to your mind and which you want to try out with the course. And with that, I think this is my last slide uh, with uh, examples. Um, and then back to Jorge. Yeah, thank you, Maren. Um, yeah, these are great examples and I'm uh, a little bit familiar with the ESNet Florida International. It's uh, just a great example of can be, what can be done with um, P4. Uh, and by the way, this is, uh, of course, a massive, uh, a massive project, uh, but uh, to somehow the ideas that Ali was uh, describing today um, apply to, to that project. Um, all right, so we are over time. I wanna thank you all. Um, before we conclude this morning <clears throat> session, so we are at the end of the day number four. Tomorrow we will be finishing. We will be discussing. Uh, for me, I believe is one of the most interesting topics in P4: how to use registers, which is uh, uh, the most powerful object for a stateful. Uh, programming. So we will be doing that one lab and lab number 11, uh, communicating uh, from the data plane to the control plane. And with that, we will be finalizing um, this workshop. We will be here for uh, in the afternoon today uh, from one to two. If there is any questions or you want to discuss any topic, uh, if you are not here, uh, we will see you tomorrow. So have a good afternoon, everyone, and the channel the Zoom will be open, so we will be back here for office hours uh, in about 45 minutes. Thank you. All right, welcome back to the office hours, uh, day number four of this workshop on um, before programmable data plane switches. Um, so I don't know if there is any suggestion for this afternoon, otherwise we can just review what we did today. Um, if there is some lesson learned for, uh, for the organizers um, and the plan for tomorrow. Um, so the first thing is we need to update the website. Um, uh, motivation and application of a stateful elements in P4. Um, hopefully, Marianne will send us the slides. Um, is there anything that we should uh, improve lab five and seven, what we were discussing today, like lessons learned? Um, yeah, I think uh, for lab number five, uh, we were using the ingress global timestamp and ingress global timestamp. Mm -hmm. So essentially we are computing the all the delay or all the time this packet spent in the ingress and in queuing. Um, mm -hmm. But there are other uh, other fields provided by the standard metadata. Um, mm -hmm. And I believe those are uh, just for the queuing part. So you will exclude all the other processing. Yep, I didn't. Uh understand very much uh, why they, why the, 
Uh, we decided to use that, but the, uh, there are the Q time. The, I don't know what is this, but it, the, the the name is telling me that it's Q in some delta. I don't know which delta, so it's mm -hmm. something. And Q times time. I mean, it seems as exactly as you said, Ali, that there are much better ways to measure uh, Q in delay. Yeah, the in Q time stamp and DQ uh, time stamp, these mm -hmm. are the, the ones. Uh, I think the time delta, I, I read about it, but it seems that it, uh, I, I remember that was like three years ago. It wasn't implemented on the, uh, on the, on the, on the software switch. So essentially, if you call it, it will always get you zero, uh, but I don't know if it has huh. been updated since then. Yeah. So yeah, we, we should improve these, uh, as soon as we finish this workshop, otherwise we forget all the um the input and what we have to learn what we have to improve mm -hmm. so this is something that we should do as soon as we finish the workshop um, um how about number seven uh lab seven anything that is there to improve i think oh, it's straightforward <laughs> Go ahead, Ali. No, we're just gonna say that's like counter or simple. So we we just like it's all about reading and writing. There's couldn't but we we can't do it too much in this lab. We may add a uh, section showing how to reset the counter. That could be something else you add there. Um, I don't know. I don't remember the operations that you are doing over the counters here. Direct counter. Um, and then and it's just referring into the table. Well, th there are ways to uh, also, um, I believe this um, um, object direct counter has a method to increase the counter. Uh, there is not shown here. I mean, but it would be good to have another example, in my opinion. Otherwise, it's. Uh, um, I mean, you are still showing. Um, you are using here with the table, but there are other ways to use as well, if I remember well. For the. Indirect counter. Um, yeah, you are incrementing here, and also if you have, if you want to uh, uh, reset. Um, I don't know what could be a good example to show that uh, you can pass up this parameter index. Um, by the way, the slides it says idx, and here the code says index. So there should be a match between the two. Um, the workshop. And I, I find some discrepancies, so there's something to improve there. Uh, uh, check some. For, I remember, well, it's here. So here it says, um, index, but we are, you're, we're not using indirect counter IDX rather than index. So just uh, something to improve this set of slides. Um, that's all I remember. I don't know if you, if there is something else that we can improve on this. Um, Ali, Jose, Ali. And taking the input from the, from the, 
um, Suju has very good input. Ellie, the one that uh, the switch, for example, uh, mm -hmm. the IP address. So we just have to make sure to make those corrections. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so what is the plan for tomorrow? Um, we have registers and digests. Yes, and there will be register and digest. I think uh, that we will not have more time, Ellie, right? That will be already uh, more than enough. Yeah, the yeah. lab number nine is short. It's just basically storing the uh, last IP address and uh, reading and showing the, the operations that we can do with registers. But lab number 11 is longer. That will take more time. And I think 50 minutes is okay. okay. So there's one lab uh, that uh, we didn't do here is, um, what was it? Meters. Meters, meters, yeah. I don't know if we will have time. Italo, feel free to unmute yourself. And if you have any input, we're, we're welcoming that. Thank you, Professor Jorge. Uh, ju just one question. As, so tomorrow in the labs that we are going to do, especially on lab 11, um, are we going to discuss something more like related to port status or something like this? So how can the data plan notify the control, the control plan about uh, changes on the port status? Especially, I'm looking especially for building applications that can use, for instance, DFG or something like this, that we can detect like uh, actual forwarding, if the actual forwarding is working, and uh, how can we actually notify the control plane in a very efficient way. Yeah, we can use, we can leverage like the P4 runtime or any specific uh, APIs, gRPC or something like this, but I was wondering if there is any uh, more efficient way to do that. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Go ahead, Ali, if you have an input. Um, if I understand well, you you would like to notify the control plane if there's some port is down. Um, I mean, this is, if we talk about the software switch, the VMV2, um, I don't think there's like a way to do that. Um, but in the hardware, um, we know, for example, we work here at, the, at USC with, uh, uh, with Intel Tofino. The hardware switch. Um, so there's something called back packet generator, and the packet generator um, it has the feature that will detect when a port is down and will automatically send a, a notification or send a packet to the data plane, which in turn you can have a notification to the control plane. And this is going to be like a very high speed uh, because you are using it directly in the data plane. And um, the BMV2 switch usually. Um, you know, because it's not designed for high performance and high speed processing, I don't think there's any um, primitive or any feature that is available like that. And now when we talk about like Lab 11, you were asking about that, it's more like uh, sending arbitrary data from the data plane to the control plane. For example, uh, uh, some packet was received and you wanna notify the control plane that we haven't seen this IP before maybe you should add it to your uh, forwarding table, then we can push this kind of information. Um, and really any kind of information, not only IP addresses, um, but accessing the port information, um, I don't know if there's a field for that in the MV2. And I know that for the hardware, there is something like that. Is this in the intrinsic metadata? Um, I'm, I'm not sure if in the MV2, I can check that. Uh -huh. Let's see. Or perhaps there because... is. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. Go ahead, Italo. Uh, uh, no, just just to comment out that I believe for BMV2 there is the B4 action selector, if I'm not wrong, but that is for a different purpose. If I'm not wrong as well, because I, I believe the the action selector is for uh, link aggregation or something like this. Um, but according to a Lee answer, maybe it's worth to look into factor generator or to right? 
Yeah. Um, and just for curiosity, are, are you, uh, Italo, are you working with uh, also with uh, Tofino switches? Yeah. Yeah, I'm working at the Tofino Suites right now. I work for Florida International University. So when Maria mentioned the Q-Factor project, I'm directly uh, involved in the Q-Factor project right now. <laughs> yeah, oh, oh uh, I didn't know that you were working in, uh, with Florida International. I, I I know the work that he's been doing. I mean, you are doing then, uh, but it's uh, 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 Becerra, uh, Geronimo. Yeah, Geronimo is my supervisor, so uh, we are working together on that project. And yes, okay. Matt is also collaborating. Yeah, that's correct. All right, all right. Um, yeah, good to know that you are working with uh, Tofino because we um, are, at least, is that working on this, but uh, at least you are helping Ali Maslum. Ali is looking at, yeah, Ali is a little bit different project. Um, looking at the tech um, blockage in um, wireless networks uh, as, as quick as possible in the data plane. Um, it's somehow related, but it's not the same. So if we find uh, information, if, if Ali or Ali find information, for sure, we will let you know. So back to do the program for tomorrow. Um, um, Ali, Ali, Jose. So we will not. We were not able to cover meters. Is the last um, object that uh, we are missing here, beside registers. So, do you think we will have time for register tomorrow, or it's going to be too tight? Uh, excuse me for meters. That's uh, a long lab. I I don't know if we will have time. I have to okay. check that. Um, yeah, and I don't know if if uh, it's like the the agenda should be fixed like that for Friday because we are finishing at a little bit earlier. Um, it's it's better to leave a little bit earlier just to have input of the. Mm. Of of the people who attend the conference. We wanna have the input always and the survey. Um, that's why we're finishing a little bit early. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, Lab 11, um, it's not like it's difficult, but it has a lot of uh, writings specifically in Python because you are writing a controller there. Um, and the Lab 9 is more like, I think it's 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 not that long, like reading and writing to registers, but we have also lab 10, which we are not showing here, but that one is more complicated because it has uh, um, features like hashing flows and um, having a register array rather than only one entry. And it's more complex than lab nine. Okay. But uh, yeah, I don't think if we add one more, it's gonna fit. All right, well, let's just leave it there. I prefer to spend more time then and just finish well uh, two laps rather than make two time. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, Ma Marian, I don't know if you are here. Would you mind sending me the last version of your presentation? So I will be posting here. Uh, yeah, you should have the last version because I sent you the Google link. Okay, okay, I will just download them. Okay. Thank you. Um, right, so we have the plan for tomorrow. Um, anything else to discuss? Any, any, any questions, observations? I think uh, it's a good idea later on to have like a continuation, like more applications on on these specific uh, topics, especially like the topics that we're gonna cover tomorrow, registers and uh, a control plane, because in lab 11, for instance, we are showing how we can use packet digests, um, but also there's a, another big concept in my opinion that is there, which is how we create a standalone 
a control plane that is not really using the simple switch CLI. So we are building a program, a Python program that is connecting to uh, using Thrift that is connecting directly to the switch daemon. And if you are writing a, an application, you're doing research, I think it's more like more likely that you would need to have like a dedicated application for that. Um, but I think those are for the future, like some labs to add or to improve. Uh, yeah, yeah. Another thing that we are not covering and will be interesting is doing a lab or two labs for cloning and recirculation. Anything with covering those topic? We cover more of what of, of the things that we you can do with the data data plane. Jose, I apologize, I didn't hear you. Uh, oh, no, I'm just mentioning that we might include two more labs with a cloning and recirculation. And yeah. with that, we cover most of the things that you can do in the data plane. Yeah. And the, the other thing that is, uh, where are we right now with the uh, labs, with um, the Tofino, Tofino lab series? Because that is something that, uh, um, I believe could be very useful. Um, oh, uh, the last thing that I was working on is uh, like the first set of labs, but I just like stopped because I was like mainly working research. I'll yeah. resume um, after this workshop. Yeah, we might want to discuss also uh, about that. Um, maybe to have one lab uh, library by by the end of the year, which is very doable. I don't want to. I mean, you, you are working on, on your research. I don't want you to deviate too much, but maybe by the end of the year, having this library. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so um, then uh, we are done for today. Uh, thank you all. Um, let's, we're meeting again tomorrow at nine, a.m. Pacific time, and uh, that will be the, the last day. So have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, you Thank too. Thank you, you too. Thank you, you too. Thank you.